James chapter 4, beginning with the latter part of verse 8, where James exhorts, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. The scripture does paint sin as a defilement a filth that must be washed or cleansed. In Psalm 18, the psalmist said, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord re recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. And so cleanse your hands. Uh, it, there is in the picture the idea of, you know, as we <laughs> make contact with the world, uh, it is often our hands that get soiled in our contact with the world. You're working and all. Uh, fellas, you're changing uh, the brake drums on your car. You know how your hands get. And, you know, you start to come in your, the house and your wife says, don't come in here until you've washed your hands, you know. But the hands seem to be the thing that get the defilement. And so in a spiritual sense, then it, it's sort of carried over. Uh, and, and so in this cleanse your hands, it's in a spiritual sense. That part of us that in our contact with the world seems to get defiled. The washing, the cleansing. The psalmist asked the question, who shall enter into the hill of the Lord? And he answered it, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. David, when he prayed to the Lord for forgiveness after his sin with Bathsheba, prayed, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And so that, that sense of, and that sense of need for cleansing. You know, there are times when we are mingling of necessity with the people of the world. We hear their language. We hear the things they're talking about and, and the filth that comes forth. And, and there are often times I feel like I'm, I'm sort of polluted and defiled by the things that I've heard. And I sort of feel like I need to take a shower when I get home. Well, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And I think that a lot of times when we've been out and, and we've had to mix and, and we've been exposed to some of the pollution and the filth of, of the world and the minds of people, that it's probably a good idea to just come home and sit down and read the Word. Just let it wash our minds and cleanse our minds from the filth and the defilement of the world. God declared to the people through Isaiah, When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear, because your hands are full of blood. Wash, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. And so God is saying, wash. Don't come to me with your bloody hands. You remember when Pilate was being forced against his will, to turn Jesus over to be crucified. 
that he finally said, bring me a basin of water. And he began to wash his hands. And of course, it was a symbolic kind of an action. He began to wash his hands in front of the people. And he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. I want you to see to that. And, and thus it was a symbolic ash action of, of washing the hands. And, and thus it gives that sense of, of washing away the defilement. James in exhorting his readers to cleanse their hands, makes us ask ourselves the question, have my hands become soiled with the things of the world? Has my mind been filled with pollution? The wonderful thing is the word of God tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. All of the defilement of the world, the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. You know, it doesn't matter how soiled your mind, your life might be. The marvelous gospel that we have to proclaim is that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man from all sin. The prophet Zechariah prophesied of the day when God would open a fountain in the house of David to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And so we sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he warned them about deception. And he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed. Oh, thank God. Yes, all of sin, all have come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But thank God he has provided for us a cleansing, a washing, from our sins. When John was taken up into heaven, he saw a great multitude that no man can number out of all of the nations. And the elder said unto John, Who are these? Where did they come from? And in essence, John said, Well, I don't know. Who are they? And he said, These are they who came up out of the great tribulation who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. These are they who came up out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. His second exhortation is purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James says purify your hearts. And I immediately can see difficulty in this command. Because we really have difficulty knowing our own hearts. The prophet Jeremiah said, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And he asked the question, Who can know it? 
So if I can't and I don't know my own heart because of its deceitfulness, then how can I purify my heart? David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be some way of wickedness in me. Lord, you search me. You try me. I don't know myself. I don't know what I would do under certain circumstances. I don't know how strong I might be. Test me, Lord. Let me see my weaknesses so that I will learn to rely and to trust in you completely. How can I purify my heart? I need to ask God to do that for me. And so by prayer, asking God, make me pure, Lord. Make me pure. The writer to the book of Hebrews says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. And so he speaks about drawing near with a true heart that is full of the assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled from evil. And then he closes without, uh, saying without wavering. And so here, James, it ties together. Wavering is a double heart. And, and James is, is telling us here uh, not to have a double mind. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. That's how my heart is purified, holding fast to that profession of faith. In the first chapter of James, he also relates the double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways, uh, the wavering with the double-minded man. But note, he is faithful who has promised. You know, oftentimes we are stressing our faithfulness to God, but it's fascinating to me that the Bible so often is stressing God's faithfulness to us. I may not always be faithful to God, but he is always faithful to me. He's always faithful to his word. And so I can lay hold of these promises because of the faithfulness of God to keep his word and his promises. You know, God is very interested in our hearts, what's going on in our hearts. David, in 1 Chronicles 29.7 prayed, I know also, my God, that you try the heart, and you have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the unrighteousness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now I have seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments and thy testimonies and thy statutes and do all, do all of these things and to build this place for the which I have made provision. But God, keep our hearts. Give my son Solomon a perfect heart, Lord, that he might keep your commandments. And then when he instructed Solomon, his son, he said, And thou, Solomon, my son, 
Know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart. So not only does he command his son Solomon to serve the Lord with a perfect heart, but then he prays, O oh God, give him a perfect heart. A heart, Lord, that's completely towards you. That's not double-minded. The idea, again, the perfect is complete. It's total. A heart that's totally for God. Not double-minded. God, through the prophet Isaiah, complained about the people. He said, they draw near to me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God called to Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your vain thoughts lodge within thee? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Cleanse your hands. Purify your heart. I woke up this morning quite troubled. Because of a dream that I had. It was a dream that was frankly rather filthy. And I thought, God, where did that come from? I don't think on those things. I abhor those things. Where did that come from? And I was really disturbed when I woke up this morning. I was praying and asking God to help me. I, I don't even want that in, 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 in the dream realm. God knows that I want my heart to be pure before him, my mind to be pure. Sleeping or waking, I long for a purity of heart and of mind before God. James says, be afflicted, mourn and weep. Afflictions can come from God, or we can afflict ourselves, or others can impose in afflictions upon us. It's amazing how many times the Bible speaks of afflicted, or affliction, or being afflicted, and, and so often, it speaks of how God afflicted the people because of their sin. God allowed them to be afflicted by their enemies because of their sins. And how God called upon the people to afflict themselves. That is to repent and, and to, uh, here it is, affliction with mourning and weeping. Whenever God afflicts us, it's for our benefit. Manasseh was probably one of the most evil kings in the history of Judah. He was the son of Hezekiah, and he led the people of Judah into horrible idolatry. During his reign, the nation went to the bottom morally and spiritually. When you have a leader of a nation who is not a strong man 
morally. The nation is often prone to follow the immorality of the leadership. And such it was with Manasseh, a horrible king. And so because of his evil, God afflicted Judah. He allowed the troops of Assyria to come and to capture the people. And the king of Assyria, we read, or we read, took Manasseh among the thorns. He bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. This horrible, wicked King Manasseh was afflicted by the king of Assyria. And we read, however, when he was in affliction, he sought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. But the affliction led him to the repentance, to the humbling of himself before God. And that's the purpose of God allowing affliction, is to turn us from our iniquity, from our sinful ways. In Psalm 119, the psalmist said, it's good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Affliction was good for me. In Psalm 119, 67, he said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. And then David acknowledged in Psalm 119, 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. So God uses affliction for correction in our lives. In the fifth chapter here of James, he uses the word afflicted again, and he says, are any afflicted? Let him pray. Are there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. Now it's interesting, he makes a distinction, distinction between the affliction and between sickness. If you're afflicted, then you need to pray and, and seek God. Find out, God, what's wrong? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. It was good for me that I was afflicted because I turned back to God. Maybe God is dealing with me in affliction. And, and we can be afflicted in different ways. And if a person is afflicted, he said, let him pray. God many times brought affliction upon the people of Israel. And the purpose was to cause them to mourn over their sins and to repent and turn to God so he could show his grace and mercy. Psalm 102, the title of the psalm is A Prayer of the Afflicted When He Is Overwhelmed and Pours Out His Complaint Before God. And, and, and thus the whole 102nd Psalm, that, that's the title of the psalm. It's just the prayer of a man who has been going through affliction and he pours out his soul before the Lord. James seems to be speaking in this verse of the affliction of one and, and the result should be the mourning and the weeping. Jesus said, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poverty of spirit is something that always results when a person has a true encounter with God. The moment you have a true encounter with God, you are going to become extremely conscious of your own sin. When Isaiah had his encounter with God, chapter 6, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on the throne. His glory filled the temple. Then said I, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. When Peter met Jesus, he said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And a true encounter with God will always bring to you a consciousness of your own sin because suddenly I'm not looking at myself in the light of those around me. I'm seeing myself in the light of God, that blinding light of God, that penetrating light of God, that exposing light of God. You can't hide anything in that light of God. It shines into every nook and cranny and lightens up the dark areas. Everything is exposed and revealed in the light of God. And when you see yourself in the light of God, there is that tremendous consciousness of guilt and sin that we don't experience in our day-to-day -day routine, meeting with others. We're so often prone to compare ourselves with others. Jesus said, that's, that's a fault. We shouldn't be doing that. You are of those who do compare yourself with each other. That's not good. I'm not the standard of comparison. I'm not the standard by which you should compare yourself. Jesus Christ, God is the standard. And we need to see him, and in seeing him, you see yourself. And when you see yourself, there is that poverty of spirit. You can't think that, oh, I'm really somebody. Well, I, you know. No, there's that poverty of spirit. And it follows, blessed are they that mourn. You see, it follows this realization of my own sinfulness. And so he says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And and as we start to really ask God to deal with these sins and with our hearts, and we begin to see what's there, it begins to bring that consciousness of guilt and sin and the mourning over the sin that's in our lives. Be afflicted and mourn. Oh, God, how could I do these things? How could I think these things? How could I propose these things? Be afflicted and mourn, weep. He said, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. May God help us to see what a Serious thing, sin is. So often people take sin very lightly. Let your laughter, he said, be turned into mourning. Sin is no laughing matter. Now, we are living in a day when people like to make a joke out of sin. And so many of the jokes that the world thinks are so humorous are jokes that are predicated on making light of sin. And, and there's some kind of a sinful twist 
that seems to be humorous to the natural man. Sin is no laughing matter. How Satan would love to have us laugh about sin. But we should mourn over sin. All we have to do is look at the cross and see the suffering of Jesus upon the cross and we will realize that sin is not a laughing matter. It's a serious matter and God looks upon it seriously and it costs God tremendously to provide pardon and forgiveness for our sins. And so, cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. Seeing ourselves in the light of God, may we afflict ourselves and mourn and weep. And may our laughter be turned into mourning and our joy into heaviness over the awareness and the consciousness of our sin. Don't take it lightly. Don't make it a laughing matter. With God, it's no laughing matter. It's serious. Father, we ask tonight that your Holy Spirit will impress us even now with the awfulness of sin. May we never make light of it. May we never laugh about it. But God, may we mourn over our weaknesses. May we afflict ourselves. And repent. And turn from our sins, O oh God. Help us to be pure. Purify our minds, our hearts, that we might be like you, Lord. Pure even as you are pure. Holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.